what we're going to talk about today is the neonatal period, right? This neonatal experience. Um, and the, the main thing with the neonatal experience is that upon delivery, this newborn, this neonate, has to make the transition, the physiological transition, from fetal life to extra uterine life, okay, to, from fetal life to the neonatal life. Um, and there are many sig very significant changes that have to happen um, to transition from intra to extra uterine life. Okay. And this transition has to be um, swift. It needs to be smooth and it needs to be successful. Okay. Um, and the majority of neonatal deaths or deaths that occur in this period of time is um, as a result of, uh, of something going wrong in that transition. Okay. So if we think about what fetal life was like compared to extra uter or uterine life, basically, I had a lactation consultant that used to say that um, in the womb, in, in fetal life, the baby used to get womb service, right? And so now, um, outside of uh, mom, we have to provide everything. Um, so the baby got basically everything it needed it needed when it needed it, right? Without having to ask for it, um, and without actually having to do anything. Uh, so the baby in, in utero got oxygen from mom. Um, the placenta did most of the metabolic work of baby, um, even once the baby's organs were were functionally more competent than uh, they were previously. And so in extra uterine life now, the baby's got to actually initiate many physiological um, changes in order to, to adapt to this extra uterine life. So among these physiological transitions include the establishment of continuous respiration. And, there, and there's a reason why that's number one, because that is absolutely the primary um, need upon birth. The primary need upon um, entering the world is the establishment of the first respiration and then continuous uninterrupted respiration after that. And then that the next um, number two, what we have to do is actually fundamentally change. This fetus, which is now a neonate, has to fundamentally change um, some aspects of their circulatory system. Okay. And so we'll talk about this, but in the, f in the fetal circulatory system, the blood actually has two ways that it can bypass the lungs. Okay. Because the lungs in utero aren't really doing anything except growing and developing. They're not a source for respiration or oxygen delivery. So beyond just perfusing the lungs because they're cells and need oxygen, blood flow to the lungs is, is of minimal importance in fetal life. So there are two ways that the, um, that the fetus can actually bypass sending blood to the lungs. And there's one within the circulatory system, so there's a blood vessel bypass. And then we also have um, a shunt that allows blood to go f directly from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. Okay. So we have to close off those two shunts because now in extra uterine life, we have to send all of our blood flow to the lungs, okay. not just a little bit. There's also the need for, I'm going to skip to five before I say four and six, um, there's also a need for independent thermoregulation. So now this baby has to regulate its own body temperature on its own. It no longer can rely on mom's body to do the work. And in order for that to be successful, in order for independent thermo thermoregulation to be successful, this baby has to both 
has to do several things. It has to continue um, respiration. It's got to have um, a mature circulation. Right? The circulatory system has to mature. And it also has to maintain its blood glucose and establish oral feeding okay, for continuous successful hormone regulation. So these six um, physiological transitions are greatly interdependent. And all of them really are dependent on successful continuous respiration. So that will hopefully make more sense as we go through. So first let's talk about um, the transitions in the respiratory system since that's so, um, so vital. So in fetal life, um, the lungs, like I said, we're not doing much besides just growing and developing. Um, the, during fetal life, the lungs are filled with fluid. Um, and the fluid in the lungs is, was constantly exchanging with amniotic fluid. So if we go forward for a second, um, and if you remember this, this um, diagram of the sources of input and output for amniotic fluid, okay, the majority of the input for amniotic fluid came from uh, fetal urine, the majority of the output came from fetal swallowing, right? That's the, that's the major um, source of turnover. But the lungs also contribute to some of this turnover. So there's a certain amount of fluid that is, um, that enters amniotic, in the amniotic space from um, what we call fetal practice, breathing practice movements. And then um, some fluid that gets taken back into the lungs through the same uh, breathing practice movements. Okay. At birth, about 10 to 25 milliliters of that fluid within the lungs gets expelled. Okay. And with a vaginal delivery, that expulsion of fluid is mostly through um, the compression of the thoracic cavity that happens as the baby moves through the birth canal. Okay. So that fluid moves out naturally with a vaginal delivery and it has to be physically removed when you have a surgical birth. Okay. Not all of the fluid in the lungs, um, of the fetal lungs, gets expelled during delivery by any, no matter what the means are. Okay. Some of the fluid is actually going to remain in the lungs and it's going to get pulled into the alveolar space and reabsorbed into the pulmonary capillaries. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But that movement of fluid deeper into the lungs and into the pulmonary capillaries happens with the initiation of the first breath. Okay. So during fetal life, the baby is it goes through these practice movements, these breathing practice movements. And we call these um, fetal breathing movements, or FBMs. Okay. Now, these FBMs start very, very early on, as early as the first trimester. They're very intermittent, they're rapid, they're irregular. Okay. So fetal breathing movements um, are fairly erratic movements. They tend to be very high rate and they tend to be fairly um, uh, irregular, meaning that you have um, about a fast breathing, you might have slightly a uh, small um, period of, of no movement followed by a return of very fast breathing movements. Now these fetal breathing movements are very important. They're actually pra they're practice breathing movements. Um, they stimulate lung development, okay? the constant taking in of amniotic fluid into the lungs stimulates uh, lung maturation and lung development. Okay. And as gestation progresses, okay, as this baby gets closer and closer to term, these fetal breathing movements start to look a little bit more like um, 
the kind of breathing that you'll see in the newborn. They become stronger, they beco become more regular, more frequent, and they start to get um, a sleep-wake cycle. Right? So the, the frequency of the breathing starts to change whether the baby is asleep or awake. And then as the baby gets closer to term, you also start to see an activation of the control of respiration, right? These peripheral and central chemoreceptors are starting to um, respond to maternal levels of CO2 okay? and pH and things like that. Okay? And so anything that elevates maternal and fetal CO2 is going to stimulate the fetal breathing movements. And these fetal breathing movements are also going to be inhibited by things like hypoglycemia. So if the glucose levels fall too low, um, if mom starts to smoke, if she consumes alcohol, um, or if she has uh, abnormal um, labor, accelerated labor, or some sort of difficult labor, complicated labor. Okay. So these fetal breathing movements, although they're not respiratory in nature yet, they, they really start to match the pattern of what will be later real breathing movements. Okay. So babies born, the most urgent need after delivery is the initiation of ventilation, okay. is trying to get that baby to take that first breath. So lots of factors are going to interact to stimulate that first breath. Number one, a change in temperature. Baby goes from mom's um, body temperature, right, an environment that matches mom's body temperature, to basically room temperature. Okay. And when the baby's body registers a particular discrepancy between, or a particular change in, in temperature, okay, which is about a 12 degree change in temperature, 12 degrees or more, it triggers an activation of the baby's sympathetic nervous system. Okay. So baby enters the world, all of a sudden it goes from 98.6 to, I don't even know what room temperature is, right, 70, even if it's a nice warm room, 70. All of a sudden, it registers that change in temperature and its sympathetic nervous system turns on. And that sympathetic nervous system activation, that flood of catecholamines in the baby's body, okay, absolutely important. Yes, it's stressful. It's a, birth is a very stressful experience, but that stress is essential. That stress is going to um, stimulate that first breath, and it's also going to do several other things, including activating um, the production of glucose, activating thermogenesis, okay, so many of the other things we're going to talk about. So the change in temperature stimulates that first breath. The mild asphyxia and acidosis that occurs with, um, actually, it occurs through, through labor, right? So if you recall, during labor, mom was, was somewhat acidotic because she was going through periods of holding her breath, right? Her, re her respiratory pattern was changing, and it was making her somewhat acidotic. And so the, whatever is happening to mom, it's going to be happening more dramatically to baby. So the baby has this mild asphyxia and acidosis associated with the entire birth, uh, labor and birth process, but also cord clamping um, continues that. Okay. And again, normal and important, because what that does is trigger those, those chemoreceptors in the baby's brain to stimulate that first breath. And then lastly, and it's, this is certainly not a minimal um, source of stimulating that first breath, it's all of the tactile stimulation of delivery. As that baby gets squeezed and head compressed and pushed through the birth canal, that's a lot of tactile stimulation 
And so that tactile stimulation really helps trigger that first breath as well. It also helps trigger a lot of um, uh, neonatal movement, a lot of um, wakefulness and right stress. So babies that are born um, through vaginal delivery get a lot of they get a lot of stimulation, right, as they move through the birth canal. And when they come out, they tell you how they feel about it. They're usually really unhappy about that stimulation, right? My daughter screams, bloody murder when she was born. You compare that to babies that are born through surgical births, you can actually really tell the difference. Babies that are born through surgical births need physical tactile stimulation to get them to really kind of get that same um, feeling because they're not going through that that experience of moving down the birth canal. Okay. So um, preparing for this reminded me of a, does anybody, has anybody heard of a blog called The Honest Toddler? It's called The Honest Toddler, you've heard of it or you have a question? No. <laughs> yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. That first breath is going to happen um, when, so so when you're not you're not having a water birth, right? That first breath is going to happen when the baby can take that first breath, right? And it's stimulated to take that first breath. So when you're not having a water birth, when the baby is fully delivered, right? It it takes that first breath. As long as it's still in the birth canal, even if the, the head is, is, is um, even if the head has been delivered, um, the, the thoracic cavity is still compressed going through the, the birth canal. So as soon as it comes out and it has that ability to expand its chest, it's going to do so. If the baby, if it's a water birth, the baby's going to take the first breath when it emerges out of the water. Babies have a natural response called a diving reflex, which means that when they are submerged in water, they do not breathe. And so they're not going to drown. They're not going to attempt to breathe and breathe in water and drown. Right? And, so, and, it's, and it's not going to cause a problem within, the, within a reasonable amount of time because the baby is still attached to the placenta. It's still receiving um, some oxygen coming from the placenta. So emerging from a water birth and having a few seconds underwater not breathing is not a problem for baby, but it's, it's got to get out of the water and take that first breath. Does that make sense? Yeah. I believe, I'm guessing, I think it's three to six months. Um, it's a significant amount of time. It's a, it's a good amount of time. Does anybody happen to know how long the diving reflex lasts? It's how long the diving reflex lasts, how long um, babies m maintain the diving reflex. It's a little longer. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a, it, it's, a, it's a good amount of time. Yeah. 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 Um, no, so the diving reflex is a reflex that ins the baby instinctually holds its breath when it's underwater. But if it became, um, if, it, if, it, if, if the CO2 levels got too high, they would still trigger the respiration and drown, right? So, you, so the baby's not going to hold its breath indefinitely. It's a natural sort of holding your breath thing, yeah, before it knows cognitively to hold its breath, yeah. Six months, thank you. That was some reason I thought it was six months. So, so six months, yep. Yeah. I, I don't know why they, I, I, I have no knowledge of why they would recommend that. Um, you know, it, it could be because everybody 
has a different degree of, of how strongly they're going to do it, and maybe it's just most, it's just safest on the back. Um, but yeah, yeah. So on his topper, um, so I'm actually excited that none of you have seen this because it is maybe the funniest thing in the whole wide world. Um, it's a, it's a mother who, uh, well, I shouldn't have told you that, but uh, it's a blog that's written from, from a toddler's perspective. And um, one, of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite entries is called the Apgar. Um, and it's all about how, you know, I would have studied harder had I known there was going to be a test. Um, and I hope it doesn't affect my college entry and that kind of thing. <laughs> it's really, really funny. But it's, but it's uh, all about the, the Apgar test that actually um, part of the measure of the test is that spontaneous first breath, taking that first breath, right? And so the APGAR test is really um, uh, assessing the need for, for neonatal resuscitation, right? Whether you need to intervene to help this transition along. Um, and so respiration, spontaneous respiration is a key part of the APGAR test. So I recommend reading that when you get a chance because it's really very, very funny. Um, it's a good read. OK. So that first breath, um, absolutely urgent. It's also um, very difficult. It also takes a lot of effort, that first breath, because the lungs of this, of this newborn are collapsed. The alveoli are collapsed. Okay. And the surfactant, while if it's a full-term baby, is, is there, it's not dispersed. Right? It's not fully dispersed. So what's going to happen, the baby is going to take this, uh, mobilize a lot of effort to take this big first breath. And what's going to happen is whatever fluid was left in the lungs not expelled right, is going to then get pushed down into the alveolar space. It's going to help distribute, evenly distribute the surfactant, and it's going to get absorbed by the pulmonary capillaries. Okay. And so every breath after that, is going to take a lot less effort. So most babies are going to take that big first breath, that big gasp, within six seconds um, of birth. And within 15 minutes of birth, they will have, um, most babies will have a, a quote unquote normal breathing pattern. And I'm saying quote unquote because if you've ever seen a newborn baby, a healthy newborn baby breathe, it looks nothing but, right? It looks anything but regular. It, um, initially newborns um, tend to have sort of a, a breathing pattern that still resembles somewhat their fetal breathing movements. Right? So, um, they tend to have a very high ventilation rate and um, bouts of an irregular pattern, bouts of these shallow, rapid um, fetal breathing type um, respir uh, respirations. And even these periods of breath holding, right, where they'll, they'll breathe very rapidly and then they'll seem to hold their breath for a little while and then they'll breathe again. Um, initially, newborns are in uh, both metabolic and respiratory acidosis, a, a mild amount of um, metabolic and respiratory acidosis. And that's because of the decreased O2 delivery during labor and delivery, um, the increased production of lactic acid because there is a lot of um, metabolic demands during, during labor and delivery, and, and then increased CO2 production because of that. Uh, acid base normalizes as um, ventilation improves. So baby eventually is going to blow off that excess CO2, replace its O2, and, um, and the acid base uh, is going to uh, normalize. For the few st first few weeks, babies are going to have a very much a dedicated division of labor for their breathing. They're going to breathe only through their mouth, and they're going to suck through their, uh, breathe only through their nose and suck through their mouth. Okay. So for a newborn baby, it can actually continue to breathe while it nurses. Okay. It, will, it will be able to breathe, continue to feed and breathe. 
and it's this this division of labor of breathing through the nose and sucking through the mouth is relevant because a, a newborn's nasal passages are extremely tiny, right? And anything that um, that either obstructs the nose or impairs um, airflow through the nose is going to affect respiration, okay? And it's going to affect, um, it could potentially cause uh, asphyxia. So babies have a relatively high oxygen consumption need. Okay. So con comparing their oxygen consumption needs to the overall size of, of their bodies, their needs are very, very high. Um, and this is because they have to produce a significant amount of heat to help regulate their body temperatures. And the way they produce that heat is through metabolic activity. And so because of these higher O2 requirements, neonates are more susceptible to asphyxia than any other age group. Okay, so you want to make sure baby's always breathing, nothing's impairing um, respiration. So as we'll see in just a moment, continuous respiration from the beginning of that, from the first breath and then on, Continuous respiration is going to be essential right, for many things, including the successful transition of the circulatory system and the closure of the circulation shunts in baby. Okay. As we'll talk about later, the, shunt, the closing of those circulatory shunts only happens once respiration is established. And then that the closure of those shunts are actually reversible um, early on. And so anything that interrupts respiration can actually um, open up those shunts again. So we'll go over that in just a moment. But first let's talk about, before we get into the circulatory cha uh, changes, Let's talk about um, the transition of blood, right? fetal blood versus um, this neonatal and then uh, infant blood. So before, blood, before birth, fetal blood um, is very, very different uh, from adult blood, both structurally and functionally. The fetus has larger red blood cells. It has more numerous red blood cells and it has a, a higher hemoglobin content for every red blood cell. And the hemoglobin that, these, uh, that a fetus has is fundamentally different from adult hemoglobin. It is what we call fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for oxygen. So if you remember, we talked about those um, hemoglobin dissociation curves in physiology and patho. Um, and we talked about things that cause a shift of that curve. Well, fetal hemoglobin, um, comparing to adult hemoglobin, you have a significant left shift of, of the dissociation curve. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So that means that for any partial pressure of oxygen, fetal hemoglobin is going to be more saturated with oxygen compared to adult hemoglobin. And during fetal life, that needs to be true. Right? That's absolutely essential. And then once um, this fetus enters extrauterine life, its need for fetal hemoglobin drops. And as the need drops, the actual production drops. So at term, the ratio of fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin in in this uh, baby's body is about 80% fetal, 20% adult. By six months um, after birth, by six months of age, the ratio has fallen to only 1% one, 1 um, to 99%. Okay, so 1% fetal hemoglobin to 99% adult. Okay. So s one important clinical significance of this is that for babies that are actually born with um, congenital hemoglobinopathies, so diseases that affect um, hemoglobin, like sickle cell uh, disease, 
those conditions may not be present at birth because of the presence of fetal hemoglobin. And only once this baby approaches, um, as this baby ages over the next few months, is that are these diseases going to become apparent. So if we look at the dissociation curve in um, the fetus compared to mom, so we know that for moms, so the x-axis is oxygen tension, which is another um, way to say the, the partial pressure of oxygen in mom's plasma. And then in the y-axis, instead of, um, we're used to seeing hemoglobin saturation, instead of seeing hemoglobin saturation, we're looking at um, total oxygen concentration, okay? So total oxygen concentration is what's found in both in the plasma and attached to hemoglobin. And we know what percentage of that is attached to hemoglobin. A lot, right? Like 98, 99% of total o blood oxygen is on hemoglobin. So for mom, her blood PO2 is going to vary from a high of 100 millimeters of mercury to a low of about 40, right? Arterial PO2 is 100. So this is mom's curve, that's fetus. Arterial PO2 is 100 in, for mom, oxygenated. And then venous PO2 uh, is about 40. So mom's always going back from 100 to 40, 100 to 40. Make sense? Now, if we look at the oxygen volume, oxygen co concentration of the blood at 100, when mom is fully oxygenated, the, let's say that's about 13, okay? So when mom is fully oxygenated, her total oxygen content is about 13 millimeters per 100 mils, but I'm just going to say 13. Everybody see that? So how for the fetus, for the fetus to have the same total oxygen content, it can actually get to that 13 at a much lower PO2. So let's see, 13 on the baby, let's say the um, pH is somewhere between 7.2 and 7.4. What's the oxygen concentration in baby when the, the, uh, the oxygenation is equal to mom's oxygenation? Closer to like 30, right? So baby can actually have the same oxygen content as mom at a fraction of the PO2. And that's necessary because when, when mom's oxygenated blood gets to baby, there has to be a concentration gradient driving oxygen delivery to the placenta, right? So baby's ox PO2, baby's oxygen, um, partial pressure of oxygen has to be lower than mom's in order to promote the movement of oxygen to the baby. Make sense? So while mom is moving from 10 to 40 and then back, excuse me, 100 to 40 and then back to 100, baby is moving more like 30 to 20, right? Back and forth from 30 to 20. Okay. And that's because baby has a fundamentally different hemoglobin than mom, it's fetal hemoglobin that binds to oxygen more tightly and, and to a greater extent at lower concentrations of, of plasma oxygen. Yes? No, it means that the hemoglobin is fully saturated at much lower oxygen levels in the environment. 
So for, for so we can actually assume that this we can instead of saying this is oxygen content, we can say this is hemoglobin saturation. So we know at a hundred millimeters of mercury, mom is nearly ninety nine to a hundred percent saturated, right? Their hemoglobin. So for baby to be 99 to 100% saturated, it only needs to get to a PO2 of 30. Because the hemoglobin, if there's any oxygen around, sucks it up. It, it, it binds it very quickly. Does that make sense? We don't talk about PO2 as being a percentage, right? PO2 is the um, partial pressure of oxygen in the plasma, so which is another way of saying it's the O2 content in the plasma, right? So the O2 content, O2 has to get into the plasma before it can attach to hemoglobin. So, so for, a, a, for mom, she has to have an O2 content in the plasma equaling 100 millimeters of mercury for her hemoglobin to be fully saturated. Baby only has to have 30% of that value in order for its hemoglobin to be fully saturated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can you can read this as being it's you can read this as being P, uh, the um, hemoglobin saturation. Obviously, the scale is going to then be different. But um, if you're reading this, if you want to draw another y-axis and say hemoglobin saturation, when mom is at 100, right, then right around here is about 99 to 100% hemoglobin saturated. Notice that the lines start to become dotted lines around 14 to 15 because you can't really oxygenate, you can't really get higher than that in either mom or fetus, right? So these are, those are extrapolated lines. Um, in the, in the hemoglobin dissociation curve that we learned, there's actually two y-axes. You might remember this. That the left y-axis is hemoglobin saturation, and the right y-axis is actually this, is actually oxygen concentration. So we, we have seen this before, but we haven't emphasized it before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, when we give when we give oxygen to patients, so when we when we're breathing normally, our the we're breathing oxygen that's about twenty one percent of the total air that we breathe, right? So that creates an alveolar PO two of hundred. If we're breathing fifty, sixty, seventy, a hundred percent oxygen through um, supplemental oxygen. What we're doing is we're creating higher alveolar PO2s, so you might be able to achieve things like maybe a 120, 115, something like that. And that's going to enhance the delivery of oxygen to the baby. There's a limit to how, how much higher you can get mom's oxygenation, but um, so it's going to be it's going to, it's going to be it's going to be successful at delivering just a tiny bit of oxygen more to baby, but with fetal hemoglobin, a tiny bit more oxygen means a lot more um, oxygenation of fetal blood. So it could it could have um, meaningful enough effects to be worth it, if that makes sense. So baby now once it's born. It now has, there's this transition period. Um, it takes some time for the baby's blood to become more adult-like, right, and less fetal. 
So for the first three months, the baby still retains um, some of this sort of fetal these fetal characteristics of, of its blood. So the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, are um, more fragile. They tend to have a shorter half-life, so they tend to actually die off more quickly. And because the baby still retains fetal, some fetal hemoglobin, the drive to produce new red blood cells is minimal. So for the first two or three months, the, the release of erythropoietin, the hormone that stimulates red blood cell production, is um, lower than it will be um, later on. So what this does is create a relatively lower red blood cell count for this newborn than the baby will have after three months. So it creates a bit of what we call a physiological anemia of infancy. But it's tolerated well, generally speaking. And this anemia of infancy it also um, is accompanied by a hemodilution. Okay, as the baby's plasma volume is actually rising faster than its red blood cell volume. So this transition from fetal to adult hemoglobin is going to affect the rate of red blood cell production in the baby. It's going to be reduced. And if you recall, the baby's um, iron stores right, tend to last that, those first three months of extra uterine life, assuming that the baby's full term and there's no, there were no uh, problems during, late, during the pregnancy. So that first three months where the baby's producing less red blood cells than they will start to produce um, helps preserve those iron stores for that period of time. Okay, so changes in the circulatory system. Before birth, okay, there is a minimal there's no emphasis, circulatory emphasis, on blood flow to the lungs, okay? Because fetal oxygen isn't coming from the lungs, it's coming from the placenta. So blood mostly bypasses the lungs in fetal life. We send just enough blood to perfuse, to deliver oxygen to the lungs, the lung tissue, and keep it, keep it healthy. But we bypass most of the rest of the blood away from the lungs. So the anatomical arrangement for fetal circulation is very different from the adult circulatory system. Um, and that that's has to change as soon as um, the baby enters the world. So the primary differences, the, the two major changes we're going to see in the circulatory system in this transition is um, that we have this blood flow to the, umbil to the umbilical um, to the umbilical cord that is going to go away. Okay. So we previously in fetal life we've got this umbilical blood flow, blood flow um, uh, into those two umbilical arteries um, uh, that perfuses the placenta and then away from the placenta through the umbilical vein. So the umbilical blood flow is going to go away and then we have two bypasses um, of the lungs in the, in the baby that also have to close, two lung bypasses. Um, the first bypass is the shunt that exists in the heart, and it's called the foramen ovale, and it's between the right and left atria. And then there's also a small vessel called the ductus arteriosus, and it connects the pulmonary artery, right, the blood that's going from the right side of the heart destined to go to the lungs, it connects that, that artery to directly to the aorta. So instead of going to the lungs, it goes directly into systemic circulation. 
So those are, we have to end our umbilical blood flow and we have to um, close our two shunts. So if we look at this slide, it's, got, it's a bit of a diagram or, um, or illustration of fetal circulation. So if we start um, here, okay, we start with the blood that's leaving the placenta through the umbilical vein. The blood that's leaving the placenta through the umbilical vein, if we think about that in adult terms, this is analogous to um, the blood that is actually leaving the lungs destined to go to the heart and then onto the body. Okay? Because this represents, and you can see it's a dark red, this represents oxygenated blood, fully oxygenated blood. Blood leaving the placenta, right? because the placenta is where it's getting oxygenated. So instead of gas in this fetus, instead of gas exchange happening at the lungs, it's happening at the level of the placenta. Okay. So this oxygenated blood leaves the placenta through the, through the um, umbilical vein, okay. and then it enters the baby. And the first place it goes is through the liver. And this is through um, the um, hepatic artery. Blood, blood enters the liver in the adult. Blood enters the liver through, through two places, right? The hepatic artery and what other blood enters the liver? The portal vein, okay? So blood enters the liver through two places. So this blood is entering the, the liver um, through the hepatic artery and also through the portal vein. And we know the portal vein is carrying blood coming from the GI tract, right? And this is deoxygenated blood. So it passes through the liver, right? So this blood coming from the placenta and coming from the GI tract um, passes through the liver and then it drains out of the liver through the portal, uh, through, the, through the hepatic vein and it mixes with deoxygenated blood from the rest of the venous system. Okay. So even though this, this short distance here between the liver and the heart is, draw, is colored as dark red, this is actually mix, mixed blood, meaning some of it is oxygen and so, oxygenated, and then the rest is mixed with deoxygenated blood. So that blood enters the right side of the heart through the right, into the right atrium. Okay. And then once it enters the right side of the heart, it's now faced with its first um, opportunity to take two roots. Right? So the blood can either do what it does in, in the adults, which is go into the right ventricle and then into the pulmonary artery, or some of that blood is going to not go into the right ventricle, it's going to go directly from the right atrium into the left atrium. Okay. And then once it's in the left side of the heart, it goes immediately left ventricle and then into the systemic arterial system. Okay. The blood that did not go through the foramen ovale, which is that first shunt. The blood that went to the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery. Once in the pulmonary artery, it, it approaches the second bifurcation, right, the second bypass. So some of the blood that goes into the pulmonary artery is gonna go on to the lungs and then the rest of the blood is going to go through a small vessel called the ductus arteriosus and directly get into the aorta. Okay. There's definitely some blood that reaches the lungs. Right. Now, the reason why it's a minimal amount of blood that reaches the lungs, and the reason why a minimal amount of blood reaches the lungs 
is because the lungs in the fetus, right, unlike the adult, is not the path of least resistance. Okay. Usually, pressure in the pulmonary artery and in the pulmonary circulation is very low. Pulmonary circulation usually is operates on very, very low pressures, under 10 millimeters of mercury. Okay. As opposed to systemic circulation, the aorta, which we know operates on pressures that range from what to what, if you're an average American. 120 to 80, right? 80 to 120, 80 to 120. So the pulmonary circulation might range from 6 to 10, right, diastolic, systolic, but the um, arterial system is going from 180 to 20. In the fetus, those ranges are reversed. So pulmonary circulation is a very high resistance in the fetus because all of those vessels are constricted. And then compare that to systemic circulation, those vessels are operating on much lower pressures. I don't understand what the reason behind the pressure Because it's constricted, because those vessels are constricted. And then what's the point of what's the mechanism behind it? And we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. So the so you might recall that in and you probably don't, so that's okay. <laughs> that uh, I taught you in pulmonary physiology that the, the pulmonary um, arteries are the only vessels in the body when, that, when they sense low oxygen, they constrict. Okay? So since the, the oxygen tensions, right, the PO2 of oxygen of fetal blood is really low, it's 30, 20, okay? those are oxygen concentrations that cause constriction of the pulmonary circulation. What's going to change that for the baby? Baby, What's going to change its oxygen concentration from 30 to 100 when it starts to breathe? Okay, So it's not until we start to oxygenate that blood that those pulmonary vessels are going to start to expand. Okay? In fetal life, they're, they're tightly constricted, and that limits blood flow to the lungs. Okay. So another way to view this is if you think of, of the circulatory system as being a circuit similar to a, like an electrical circuit, we know that the um, circuits can either be in series or in parallel. Okay. Now, the fetal circulatory system is described as being a circuit in parallel. And so anything in parallel means that, whether it's the electricity or blood, has a choice to go in two directions at once. That's what parallel means. And some, a, a, cir a circuit that's in series means that it doesn't have a choice. It has to go from one thing to the next. It cannot go in two directions at once. Okay. So for the fetus, if we start here, which is actually where we started in the other picture, the blood coming off of the placenta, it's um, mixing with blood that comes from the brain and the body, right? And it's entering the heart. So it enters the heart right around here. <coughs> and then it quickly encounters the foramen ovale. Some of the blood goes to the left side of the heart. The rest of the blood goes to the right ventricle and onto the pulmonary artery at the top. And then within the pulmonary artery, it's faced with another bypass point. Most of it is going to go through the ductus arteriosus. A tiny bit is going to go through the lungs, again, because those vessels in the lungs are constricted, very high pressures. The blood that goes through the ductus arteriosus is going to immediately enter the aorta, 
the m minimal amount of blood that entered the lungs is going to return to the left side of the heart before, before it enters the aorta. Okay. So at birth, what we have to do is close those, um, those shunts. So we have to close the shunt within the heart that allows blood to go directly into the left side of the heart. And we have to close the ductus arteriosus that connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And once that happens, and the umbilical blood flow, right, the placenta and the umbilical blood flow go away. Once that happens, now the circulatory system is, is an adult-style circulatory system in series, meaning that blood has to go from one structure to the next. Okay, no problem. Okay. So what creates these changes at birth? So the switch to an adult style circulatory system at birth is not an immediate one. It doesn't happen right away. Um, it begins actually around 60 seconds after birth, and, but it can take up to a few weeks to, fu to be fully complete. So there are two determining events that initiate the closure of the fetal shunts. The, uh, the arrest of umbilical circulation and the ventilation of the lungs. Okay. So first of all, the umbilical vessels start to constrict in response to stretching and handling of the cord um, and cooling of the cord and the release of the catecholamines with that stress response of birth. So birth is going to help reduce the blood flow through the um, umbilical um, vessels. The umbilical artery is going to clamp down and constrict, but the umbilical vein remains patent. Okay? So until the umbilical cord is clamped, blood can flow between baby and placenta through the umbilical vein. Yeah, very, very quickly, yeah. So with the first breaths, the lungs expand, okay? They fill with air, and gas exchange commences in, at, the, at the alveoli. Okay? And when that happens, alveolar oxygenation increases, which allows for the oxygenation of blood in the pulmonary capillaries. When this happens, the pulmonary vessels dilate. With the oxygenation of blood, the pulmonary vessels dilate. Now, if you can think about this, you go from minimal blood flow to the lungs and minimal blood flow coming back from the lungs. Blood coming back from the lungs enters where? In the heart, enters where? The left atrium, okay? So you go from minimal pulmonary blood flow to all of a sudden blood flow. Oops. To all of a sudden, did anything break? Hopefully not. Um, to all of a sudden, blood rushing into the lungs. And as the blood enters the lungs, you have blood coming back from the lungs and entering the left atrium. And if you can bear with my inability to draw, my bad drawing skills, This is right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. And the foramen ovale is sitting between the atria, correct? The foramen ovale is not a hole. It actually is a valve, okay? And it looks like, like that, okay? 
So when blood starts to return to the left atrium from the lungs, the pressure on the left side of the heart increases and that closes the foramen ovale. So the, so the increased blood flow to the lungs upon oxygenation of the blood causes blood to return to the left side of the heart and that rise in pressure closes the foramen ovale. Okay. So this is the pulmonary vein. Remember the pulmonary artery that went to the lungs, there was this, the ductus arteriosus, right? That led to the uh, aorta. Follow? So the first thing to happen is the closure of the foramen ovale. Okay. Actually, is that true? No. The first thing to happen is, well, they're happening very close together, but the first thing to happen is the ductus arteriosus. So as soon as blood starts flowing through that pulmonary artery because it's dilated, right, and blood blood flow through the ductus arteriosus goes down. The ductus arteriosus is similar to the pulmonary, um, the pulmonary vessels, that it starts to constrict. When blood flow stops flowing through the ductus arteriosus, it constricts. And that constriction is enhanced by the release of bradykinin and prostaglandins that are stimulated by the inflation of the lungs. Okay. So as all these things are coming together, the blood flow through the um, blood flow through the heart, uh, blood flow to the lungs, reduced blood flow to the arteriosus, the release of these factors, they all clamp down on the ductus arteriosus. And then as blood is returning from the lungs, it's going to close the foramen ovale. So within eight days after birth, the ductus arteriosus, um, most of the structure of the ductus arteriosus dissolves. Any time, however, within those first few days, if anything interrupts, ventilation of the lungs and oxygenation of the blood, the ductus arteriosus can open up again and the foramen ovale is going to open up again okay? because those pulmonary vessels are going to constrict and then all of a sudden blood flow is going to start bypassing the lungs. So the initiation of breathing switches the circulatory route, but the continuous respiration, the continuous ventilation of the lungs is needed to complete that switching of the circulation. Okay. Now, the ductus arteriosus tends to uh, become a permanent closure much, quick, much more quickly than the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale um, can actually open up again um, and takes several weeks for it to fully close. And for some individuals, it actually never fully fuses the foramen ovale. Okay. But the continuous elevate, the continuous difference in pressure between the left and the right side of the heart keeps it closed. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, um, in before the baby takes that first big breath, right? The vessels up here are constricted, right? Constricted, so pressure is very, very high, right? Pressure is high. So as blood moves into the pulmonary artery, it's much 
easier for it to go through the ductus arteriosus than it is to go through, go up to the lungs, right? That, that's, that's before the change happens. You follow? Now, these lungs inflate, it oxygenates that blood, and all of a sudden, they dilate. And that drops the pressure. So all of a sudden, this pressure drops, and now the path of least resistance is actually towards the lungs and not through the ductus arteriosus. What, what happens is the first, the first thing that happens is that it constricts, okay? So now all the blood is going to the lungs. And then after it stays constricted for a given amount of time, the actual parts of the structure that are a vessel start to deteriorate. And so what actually, the, what happens to the ductus arteriosus is that what you're, what you're left with is all of the connective tissue. So in an adult, there is a remnant of the ductus arteriosus called the ligamentum arteriosum. And it's basically a piece of connective tissue that can be seen between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Okay? So everything that, all the lumen and the vascular tissue has dissolved. And what you're left with is just connective tissue. Okay. What's that? Yeah, yeah. No, it is cool. Um, okay. So, yes, so the ductus arteriosus is going to, um, the closure is going to be permanent after about eight days, uh, but the foramen ovale can take uh, much longer, it can take several weeks for it to close. And like I said, for some people, it never fully closes, it never fully fuses. And so they, they maintain this potential opening, but as long as the left side of their heart is at a higher pressure than the right, it's functionally closed, okay? It remains functionally closed. And so it doesn't normally, even people who have that patency, it doesn't um, tend to interrupt or cause problems, okay? And here we see the um, dramatic reversal of pressures and blood flow, right? So um, this line represents, or this margin represents birth. And so the, 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 on the x-axis, the time in negative weeks is in fetal life. And then in positive um, numbers is after birth, is post, um, is the neonatal life. So you can see that if you compare, um, if you look at the pulmonary arterial mean pressure and pulmonary blood flow, Okay. And, then, and then the vascular resistance in the pulmonary circulation. Before birth, okay, vascular resistance is very high because of constriction. So that causes a very high pressure and very low blood flow. With birth and oxygenation of the lungs and blood, those vessels expand and that resistance plummets, okay? And simultaneously, the pressure plummets and blood flow increases. Okay? And this is really the change that's absolutely necessary for number one, oxygenation of the blood and continued blood flow to the lungs, and also that switch of the circulatory system. Okay? So they're very much hand in hand uh, and continuous respiration in that early neonatal period is, is of primary concern. Okay. okay, let's take just a two minute break. I had way too much coffee this morning. Um, and we'll come back and we'll talk about thermoregulation. <laughs>
right, guys. Let's um, let's talk about thermoregulation. So, so thermoregulation in baby. Uh, before before you're born, mom takes care of all of your thermoregulatory needs. Um, and then, of course, once you're thrown into the big bad world, you've got to do it on your on your own. Um, so let's just talk about some basics on th on human thermoregulation, and then look at it as it adapt as it applies to the neonatal period. Um, so this isn't a topic that we talk extensively about in physiology, um, but basically, as human beings, we are what we what are called homeotherms, which means that we um, maintain our own core body temperature. And I say core body temperature because we actually have two different types of temperatures in our body. We've got core body temperature, which is the temperature of deep tissues, um, the visceral tissues, and that temperature it remains constant. Assuming no pathology, that body temperature is um, remain remains constant, and it's um, actively regulated to, to be maintained at a constant temperature. And it only really changes about one degree um, in terms of vary, varying. Okay, very narrowly um, maintained. Then there is peripheral temperature or skin temperature. That temperature does not stay the same. In fact, you can have significant fluctuations in peripheral or skin temperature. Um, and this is the temperature of mostly the skin but also underlying tissue that is closest to the external environment. Okay. Now, the, what maintains, what prevents any kind of um, dissipation of, of heat between core and skin, or another way of, say, of saying this is what insulates core temperature from skin temperature, is primarily subcutaneous fat. What primarily insulates core temperature from skin temperature is subcutaneous fat. Okay. So when we're trying to maintain normal body temperature, when trying to maintain core temperature, We've got the, we have to maintain a normal amount of insulating tissue, primarily subcutaneous fat, okay? And then body temperature or core temperature is maintained by balancing the, the heat production, sources of heat production against sources of heat loss. And the sources of heat production um, is basal metabolic rate, And then any extra metabolism caused by things like muscle activity or extra metabolism caused by the effects of hormones okay, or sympathetic stimulation. So the way that we generate heat in our body is through metabolism, okay? Bas basal metabolism and then any um, extra metabolism on top of that. And then the way that we lose heat, okay, the way that we lose heat is by regulating the, um, by regulating the perfusion to the skin, okay? Because we have this insulating barrier, subcutaneous fat between core and skin, if we conserve blood flow to our core, we conserve um, heat in our core. Okay? When we choose to let more blood flow to our skin, that heat is carried by the blood to the skin, and then the heat can be lost into the external environment. And the heat, the sources of heat loss between skin and environment include things like what we call conduction, convection, and evaporation. Conduction just means that heat moves from the body to either an external object or into air that's not moving, 
So heat moves in conduction either from our skin directly to an, ex to an object or to air that's not moving. <coughs> Convection means that heat is moving from our skin to air that is moving, that's moving across our skin. And so do you think that you lose more heat from your skin when you're sitting in a, in a room where air's not moving or if you've got a fan blowing over you? Fan, right? So convection, you can lose more heat than conduction. And then the most heat is lost through what's called evaporation. And that's when your body produces sweat. And then that sweat evaporates off of your skin and it removes a significant amount of heat. So three main ways that we lose heat from skin to the environment. So we just look at this um, for a moment, this, this um, diagram. What we have is uh, temperature in the core, and the core is also where um, heat is produced, right? In metabolic tissue in the core, that's where most of our heat is produced. Um, the brain, namely the hypothalamus, controls blood flow between the core and the skin. Okay. It's going to limit blood flow to the skin if the brain feels like we are in danger of our core temperature dropping. And it's going to increase blood flow to the skin in order, if, it, if the brain feels like we're in danger of our core temperature rising. Make sense? And then the part of the brain in the hypothalamus that is our thermostat, our actual um, main it actively maintaining um, body temperature, it uses both core temperature Right, it, sen it can sense core temperature, and it also senses skin temperature as a way of predicting the direction that core temperature may or may not move in. That make sense? So if you're in, if it's winter and you go outside and your body reads, it, sh it should read a normal core temperature, but if it reads a cooler skin temperature, the brain actually says, well, we're in danger of becoming too cool, so let's pull our blood to our, to our core. And if you go outside today or yesterday or tomorrow, right, and your body reads normal core temperature but warm skin temperature, right, hotter skin temperatures, it's going to interpret that as saying we're in danger of becoming too hot, so let me enhance blood flow to the skin in order to maintain heat loss. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Because the constant convection is keeping your skin temperature at a cooler temperature. As soon as you stop and that constant heat loss is minimized, skin temperature rises and the, and the brain sends more blood to the skin. So this is like yes. Five Instant. And that's how core temperature can be maintained within this n very narrow margin. Absolutely. This is constantly happening. Yeah. Okay. So this is what, this is what happens uh, in an adult. When it comes to fetal life and then the transition in neonatal life, things are a little bit different. So in, before birth, um, the fetus completely depends on mom for temperature regulation. Generally speaking, the, the fetus is a net heat producer, right? So mom actually has, in addition to, to, its, to her own metabolic organs, it has this fetus that is producing even more heat, okay? 
So heat from, from the fetus is conducted to the placenta, and then from the placenta it's conducted to mom, and mom gets rid of this excess heat. Okay? And so this is why you, you, you talk to a woman who's pregnant in the dead of summer, and she is just so uncomfortable, right? Because she, even no matter what um, season she's going to be in, her body temperature, her body is going to be in this constant dissipating heat mode. And if the external temperatures are really hot, it's going to be very uncomfortable. Okay. And the fetus is, is maintained at a temperature that's slightly above maternal, maternal temperature, okay? Because it's, it's right in the core, right? But the baby's right at your core. So after birth, so we know that there's this cooling uh, immediately upon entering the world. Baby goes from an ambient temperature of 98.6 inside of mom to an ambient temperature of whatever room temperature happens to be. Okay, um, and the and as a result, baby starts to lose heat, and the heat loss is is happening between the baby's core to its skin and between skin and the environment. Okay, now ther thermoregulation in the baby. The baby faces a few challenges in terms of thermoregulation. Number one, it has less subcutaneous fat available to insulate its core temperature from its skin temperature. So it, it can't protect that core temperature as well as we can. And if the baby is premature and has even less subcutaneous fat, it's even more vulnerable. Okay. So that's the first thing. The other thing is the baby has a much higher surface area to mass ratio, means that it has more skin surface area in which to lose heat to the environment compared to its overall mass than we do. So for both of those heat loss gradients, core to skin and skin to environment, baby tends to be more vulnerable to heat loss on both of those counts. Okay. So we know that there's a lot of measures taken when babies are born to try to minimize, and then in the first few months of life, to minimize um, heat loss, right? We try to control the environmental temperature. Um, we put the baby under a warmer, we try to give baby contact with warming objects, the best warming object being mom, right? Skin to skin contact as much as possible. We tend to dry the infant very quickly after it's born in order to minimize evaporation, heat loss through evaporation. Um, and we tend to try to minimize convection be, uh, by using uh, swaddling methods and the use of baby hats can actually be a wonderful way to minimize heat loss because um, the very highly metabolically active brain, you can actually lose a significant amount of uh, heat loss through the, through the head, and the head is very highly perfused. Um, so drying and covering are, are ways of minimizing heat loss. But generally speaking, for baby, babies successful thermoregulation is going to ha be highly dependent on its ability to produce heat. Because it's so vulnerable to heat loss and it's reliant, it's reliant on others for everything, but it's reliant on others to minimize heat loss, the baby's ability to produce heat is going to be vital to its ability to regulate body temperature. Now, babies are born with an ability, a very special ability to produce heat through a mechanism that as an adult we don't have. Okay. So babies are born with a particular kind of tissue called brown adipose tissue or brown fat. And brown fat is opposed to quote unquote white fat which we have and the purpose of that kind of adipose tissue is just fat storage. But the purpose of brown adipose tissue or brown fat 
is heat production. And the kind of heat production that these neonates have is what we call non-shivering thermogenesis. And it's called that because as an adult, if we want to produce extra heat in order to, to warm us up if we're too cold, we start to shiver, right? Our muscles start to contract, and that produces some heat, and it's, it helps us. Babies don't tend to, shivering isn't going to help them much in terms of heat production. So their main, perp, their main way of producing heat is through this brown adipose tissue. So ad, this brown fat is very, very um, highly vascularized. We have a lot of blood flow going to brown fat. And it's densely packed with mitochondria. And it's, it's adapted, the, the m metabolic pathways in brown fat is designed to actually go through the aerobic metabolic pathways, but instead of producing oxygen at the end, it, all of that energy is liberated in the form of heat. Okay. So for our metabolism, okay, we harness something like 30-40% of that energy to produce ATP. And did I say produce oxygen? I meant ATP. And then the rest is lost as heat for us. For babies in, in brown fat, 100% of that energy is going to produce heat. It's not producing ATP. Okay. And while we do retain a very small amount of brown fat uh, as an adult, um, we have a li just a tiny bit of it that's, that's found around the kidneys and around some of the larger blood vessels. Um, and it does generate a certain amount of heat. Two to seven percent of a full-term baby's body weight is attributable to brown fat. So they, ha they have a significantly more, a greater proportion of brown fat com compared to adults. And the brown fat, which you can see the, the, um, the difference. So this is a mature um, a conventional uh, adipocyte or fat cell. Right, which we would call white fat. And it's called white because it's packed with triglycerides. And that's really its main purpose is to house triglycerides. A mature brown fat cell is, has much smaller amounts of triglyceride storage. And the rest of its intracellular space is packed with mitochondria okay, in order to produce that energy that's going to be released in the form of heat. And so that, that mitochondrial density gives it that darker color. And we see brown fat localized at the core. Okay. Brown fat is localized around the baby's core. And that's because the heat that's generated is going to be used to maintain core body temperature. And as I said, brown, the metabolic pathway that's used in brown fat is slightly different. The, it generates heat by actually uncoupling the electron transport um, chain from oxidative phosphorylation. So instead of using oxygen to phosphorylate ADP and form ATP, that energy is just dissipated, entirely dissipated in the form of heat. Okay. This kind of thermogenesis, the activation of brown fat, occurs when we have that critical difference in temperature at birth. We have to have a difference in temperature. If you think you're doing the, the baby a favor by keeping the room very, very hot, you're not, because it actually needs that difference in temperature in order to um, activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is essential in taking that first breath, in closing that ductus arteriosus, and in activating um, thermogenesis by brown fat. But 
this brown fat, this non-shivering thermogenesis, is still metabolism. It's still heat production through metabolism. And what are the things we need to drive metabolism? Number one, it's called aerobic because it needs what? Oxygen. Baby extrauterine life, continuous ventilation to provide that oxygen. Okay? We also need energy substrate. What's, what do we use as energy substrate? Food, right? So the baby needs to feed. If it's not in the womb anymore, it's not getting womb service, right? So it needs to feed. It needs to, to feed, and then one, even with feeding, it needs to regulate its own body, uh, blood glucose, right? So the baby needs to learn how to go into these periods of post-absorptive stages that are in the, that where you're not receiving anything from mom. Okay, so any any interruption in any of these things are going to affect the baby's ability to regulate its body temperature. Poor feeding, um, impaired ventilation, impaired um, glucose homeostasis, any of those things. And this is just showing the stimulation of the um, metabolism in brown fat by um, norepinephrine uh, or by sympathetic activity, that it, it breaks down the stored triglycerides in order to um, produce this metabolism and generate this heat. And I'll, and I'll end with this one uh, comment that even though babies are reliant on, on us to minimize their heat loss, generally speaking, people are obsessed with dressing babies. And no, they are, and they're obsessed with warming babies. And most, on average, parents will tend to overdress their children and will tend to, to um, put them in too many layers of clothing. And this overheating increases SIDS risk and, it's, and it impairs, it's really, a, it's really not healthy for the baby. Um, you know, my pediatrician recommended to use how, how cold or hot I am as a judge of what the baby needs. And her, her rule of thumb was whatever you need plus one layer, right? And that's enough. So, so just so you know, this is something that um, if you're around parents, you will see they tend to overdress their children uh, universally. Okay. So have a good week. I'll see you next.